Hello and welcome back. In this video, I want to begin a new topic, and that topic is magnetism. And in particular, I want to talk about the forces that are created by magnetic fields. Now, one of the interesting things about the forces that are created by magnetic fields is that these forces can only be described in terms of the magnetic field. And this is a little bit different than electrostatics. So if you remember earlier in the year, we talked about the forces that are exerted between charged particles. And we came up with this formula, uh, KQQ over R squared. Remember, this is called Coulomb's Law. And we used Coulomb's Law to define the electric field. So we said the electric field is equal to the force that would be exerted on a charged particle divided by the charge of that particle. So we defined the electric field in terms of this force formula. However, it turns out that with magnetism, there really isn't a formula like this Coulomb's Law. And part of the reason for this is that it turns out there really is no such thing as a magnetic charge. So this Q1 and Q2, there's no such thing as a magnetic charge in magnetism. So we don't have a Q1 or Q2 for magnetic fields. So instead, the forces that are created by magnetic fields are always going to be written in terms of the magnetic field. Now, even though the magnetic force is written in terms of a magnetic field, we're not going to worry about where these magnetic fields are coming from or how we calculate the strength of a magnetic field in this video. I'm going to hold off on that and we'll talk about that in a later video. However, there are a few things about magnetic fields that I should probably talk about. So most of you know that magnetic fields can be created by permanent magnets. And when we draw the magnetic field lines that are generated by a magnet, these magnetic field lines start from the north pole of the magnet and they end on the south pole of the magnet. And some of you may note that that's very similar to the electric field lines, which start on positive charges and end on negative charges. And so you may be thinking to yourself, well, then can I just have an isolated north magnetic charge, which have magnetic field lines that emanate from it? And it turns out scientists have spent a long time trying to find isolated magnetic charges, and nobody has ever been able to find one of these. So we can say with a pretty high degree of confidence that there is no such thing as an isolated magnetic charge. It turns out magnets always come in dipoles, which means there is always an equal north and south pole. So for example here, any of these magnetic field lines that are emanating from this north pole will always end on the south pole. So there's never going to be a net flow of magnetic field lines. In fact, if I completed these magnetic field lines, uh, so we have this line that's going to come around here, it's actually going to go through the magnet and then come back around. In fact, all of these lines are going to do that. So if we tried to do a sort of Gauss's Law type of a thing, it turns out that there's never going to be any net magnetic flux through any surface. So if I take like a closed surface here, the uh, magnetic field lines flowing into it will be equal to the magnetic flux flowing out of it. Uh, even inside the magnet that'll be the case because these magnetic field lines actually flow around in circles like this. So at this point some of you may be thinking, well couldn't I create a magnetic charge by just breaking a magnet in half? And the answer is, well no. If you break a magnet in half, what you're going to be left with is two smaller magnets, each with its own north and south pole. And this will make a lot more sense when we talk about uh, where magnetic fields actually come from in a later video. Now when we talk about magnetic fields, we denote the magnetic field with this capital B. And remember that magnetic fields, just like electric fields, are vectors. So they're going to have magnitude and direction. The units that we use to describe magnetic fields are Teslas, which are named in honor of the famous physicist and engineer Nikola Tesla. Uh, another common unit of magnet, uh, magnetic fields is something called a Gauss, which is equal to 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. And it turns out that the magnetic force is a very strange type of force. It's very different than any of the other forces that we've discussed so far in this class. And in particular, it differs from the electrostatic force in several important ways. The first is that the magnetic force not only depends on the charge of a particle, but it also depends on the particle's velocity. And that means it depends not only on the speed that the particle is moving, but also the direction that the particle is moving in. The second important difference is that the magnetic force 
doesn't actually point in the direction of the magnetic field. And we'll talk about how we determine the direction of the magnetic force in just a little bit. So it turns out that the magnetic force that is exerted on a charged particle is given by this formula right here. So it's equal to the charge of the particle times the cross product between the particle's velocity and its magnetic field. Now we haven't really talked a whole lot about cross products in this class, so the way we calculate the cross product between the velocity and the magnetic field is that the magnitude of this cross product is equal to the speed that the particle is traveling at times the component of the magnetic field that is perpendicular to the velocity. So for example here, if I have a charged particle and it's moving in a direction like this and I have a magnetic field which points to the right, the component of the magnetic field that is perpendicular to the velocity is this line right here. So hopefully you can see that this vector right here is going to be perpendicular to the velocity. And if we think about how we could write that in terms of the speed and the strength of the magnetic field and the angle between them, hopefully you can see that this component of the magnetic field, which is perpendicular to the velocity, is opposite the angle theta. So the strength of the magnetic force will be equal to QVB times sine of theta, because the component of the magnetic field that's perpendicular to the velocity is equal to the magnitude of the magnetic field times sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. Now, as I mentioned before, the magnetic force does not point in the same direction as the magnetic field. So how do we calculate the direction of the magnetic force? And the answer is we use something called the right-hand rule. And the right-hand rule can be something that's kind of difficult to visualize. I'll try to edit a uh, demonstration into this video. But as we work through these next few examples, I want you to actually try using the right-hand rule. So follow along using the right-hand rule. Pause the video if you have to, because the way you're going to you know, finally learn how to use the right-hand rule is just by practice. You have to actually practice using the right-hand rule to understand how it works. And there are a lot of different ways that you can do the right-hand rule. I'm going to show you one technique that uh, is fairly common. And basically, the way you do this is you point the fingers on your right hand, that's why it's called the right hand roll, in the direction of the velocity. And when you do this, there are two ways that you'll be able to orient your hand so that your fingers point in the direction of the velocity. And what you need to do is you need to orient your hand so that your fingers can curl into the direction of the magnetic field. And when you do this, your thumb is then going to point in the direction of the magnetic force. And one of the things that I want to point out about this is that it turns out, and you'll see this in these examples, that the magnetic force is always going to be perpendicular to both the velocity and the magnetic field. And so this means that in a lot of these problems, we're going to have these three-dimensional types of vectors. And very frequently, we're going to have to talk about vectors that either point into or out of the screen. And it turns out that there is a uh, useful notation that's commonly used to describe these types of vectors. So vectors that point into the screen, uh, we typically denote with an x. So something like this, if you see these, these are vectors that are pointing into the screen. Vectors that point out of the screen, we typically denote with these circles like this. Okay, so these filled in small dots. These represent vectors that are pointing out of the screen, and the vectors that point into the screen are represented by these types of x's. And if you have a hard time remembering this, a uh, useful sort of trick that a lot of students use to remember this is kind of picture it like an arrow. So if you had like an arrow, like a bow and arrow, if it were sticking into the screen, then you would see the fletchings, those, uh, those little uh, fins that are on the arrow that help it glide. And so these X's here kind of look like the fletchings on an arrow. So if the arrow were pointing into the screen, you would be seeing these fletchings. On the other hand, if an arrow were coming at you, the first thing you would see is the point of the arrow, which look like these little dots here. So let's go ahead and work through a couple of examples where we use the right-hand rule. So in this first example here, I have a particle which is moving to the right, and I have a magnetic field which points up. So remember, the way we apply the right-hand rule is you first orient your hand on your right hand uh, in the direction that the uh, velocity points. So I want to orient my fingers on my right hand so that my fingers point towards the right side of the screen. 
Now when I do this, there are two ways I could do this. I could either point my hand so that my palm is up, or I could point my hand so that my palm is down. Now if I orient my hand so my palm is pointing down, then there's no way that I can curl my fingers so that they're going to point towards the top of the screen. However, if I point my fingers with my palm up, then I can very easily curl my fingers into the direction of the magnetic field, which points up. So if I orient my hand so that my right hand points towards the right side of the screen, and I curl my fingers so that my fingers point towards the top side of the screen, then when my hand's oriented like that, my thumb is going to point out of the page. So here, the magnetic force is going to point out of the page. So the magnetic force would be represented by a dot like this. Now, in the second example here, I have a particle which is moving towards the left. So now if I orient my hand, my right hand, so that my fingers point towards the left side of the screen, so the magnetic field is pointing up, so I need to have the palm of my hand pointing towards the top of the screen so that when I curl my fingers, I can curl them in the direction of the magnetic field. And when I orient my hand in this direction, I can see that my thumb is going to point into the screen. So this means that the magnetic force that is exerted on this charged particle points into the screen. So let's go ahead and look at another example. In this example, I show the path that a particle takes as it moves through these four different quadrants. And the question I'm asking now is, what is the direction of the magnetic field in each of these four different places. Okay, so here, in this first part, we can see the particle is moving vertically upwards. And since the particle moves towards the right, this means that the magnetic force that's exerted on this particle has to point towards the right. So our velocity is pointing up, the magnetic force is pointing to the right. Now remember, let me write this down again. So your fingers, they point in the direction of the velocity. Okay, you curl your fingers or you point your palm in the direction of the magnetic field, which I usually denote as a B field for short. And then your thumb points in the direction of the force. Okay, so here I want the force to point towards the right, so I want my thumb pointing towards the right. And my fingers on my hand need to point in the direction of the velocity, and that's towards the top of the screen. So if I orient my hand so that my thumb is pointing towards the right side of the screen, and my fingers are pointing towards the top of the screen, then when I curl the fingers in my hand, they're going to point out of the screen. So this means that the magnetic field inside this quadrant one is pointing out of the screen. So our magnetic field here would be represented by these little dots. So let me draw these dots representing a magnetic field pointing out of the screen. Now when the charged particle moves into this second quadrant over here, now the particle is moving towards the right, but the magnetic field, or I'm sorry, the magnetic force is pointing up. Okay, so hopefully you can see that magnetic force points up since the particle is moving towards the right but it is changing direction and it's starting to move up. So again, your thumb points in the direction of the force. So I need to orient my hand so that my thumb points towards the top of the screen and because the fingers on my hand need to point in the direction of the velocity, I need the fingers on my hand to point towards the right side of the screen and my thumb to point towards the top of the screen. So when I do this, I see that my palm is going to be pointing inwards towards the screen. And if I curl the fingers in my hands, they're also going to point inwards towards the screen. So this means that the magnetic field in the second quadrant points into the screen. So my magnetic field would be uh, uh, represented by these X's. Now when the particle moves into this third quadrant, it's going to start out moving vertically upwards and it's going to curve, its path is going to curve so that it points towards the left. So this means the magnetic field that is uh, exerted, I'm sorry, the magnetic force that's exerted on this particle when it first enters this third quadrant points towards the left. Again, remember, the magnetic force points in the direction of your thumb. So I want my thumb to point towards the left side of the screen, and since the particle is initially moving towards the top of the screen, I need the fingers on my hand to point towards the top of the screen. So if I orient my hand so that my thumb points towards the left, 
and the fingers on my hand point towards the top of the screen, then my palm is going to point into the screen. And if I curl the fingers on my hand, they're also going to point into the screen. So this means that the magnetic field in quadrant three points into the screen. So my magnetic field will be represented again by these X's. Now in the last quadrant here, the particle starts out moving towards the left. And its path is going to curve so that the particle starts to move up. So this means when the particle first enters quadrant four, it's moving towards the left, but the magnetic force exerted on it points vertically upwards. Now remember, you orient your hand so that your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic force and your fingers point in the direction of the velocity. So here, I need my thumb to point towards the top of the screen and I need the fingers on my hand to point towards the left side of the screen. So when I do that, my hand's going to be oriented so that my palm is pointing away from the screen. And if I curl my fingers, they're also going to point away from the screen. So this means that the magnetic field inside quadrant four points out of the screen. So that would be represented by these dots. And so let's go ahead and look at one more example where we're looking at the direction of the magnetic force. So in this example, I have three different particles and these particles have different charges. And I'm gonna to try to figure out the charge of the particle based on the direction of the magnetic force. Now we haven't really talked about the effect of charge but remember, the magnetic force is equal to the charge of the particle times the cross product of the velocity and magnetic field. So this thing right here is a vector. Remember that if you multiply a vector by a positive scalar, it doesn't change the direction of the vector. However, if I multiply it by a negative number, it will reverse the direction of the vector. So that means that if you have a negatively charged particle and you apply the right hand rule, whatever direction you get for that, you're going to have to flip that if it's a negative particle, okay? So let's go ahead and look at an example here. So particle one starts out moving towards the right. So this is the initial direction of its velocity. And the magnetic field is pointing into the page. So remember, the way we find the magnetic force is you first point your hands, so that, I'm sorry, you first point the fingers on your right hand so that they point in the direction of the velocity. So here my velocity points towards the right side of the screen, so I need to orient my right hand so the fingers on my right hand point towards the right side of the screen. Now, we need to be able to curl our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. So my magnetic field points into the page, so I need to orient my hand so that my palm points towards the screen, so that when I curl the, the fingers on my right hand, they'll point into the screen. And when I orient my hand in this way, my thumb is gonna to point towards the top of the screen. So I see that for a positive particle, the magnetic force would point upwards. And in fact, if we look at the path that this particle is taking, the particle is uh, moving in a direction that is consistent with a magnetic force that points upwards. So we can see that this particle right here is a positively charged particle, which I usually, I think I have those red uh, I use red to describe positively charged particles. Uh, now, two is a little bit tricky. I'm going to skip that one, and I want to look at particle three. So particle three starts out moving vertically upwards. So the velocity vector points vertically upwards. And my magnetic field is pointing into the page. Now remember, the way we find the cross product is you first orient your hand so that it points in the direction of the velocity. So the velocity points upwards towards the top of the screen, so I need to orient the fingers on my right hand so they point towards the top of the screen. And the magnetic field points into the page, so I need to orient my hand so that my palm is pointing towards the screen, so that when I rotate the fingers on my right hand, they can point into the page. And when I do all of this, my thumb is going to point towards the left. Okay, so the cross product between the velocity and the magnetic field, that is this term right here, that points towards the left. Now clearly you can see that this particle here is actually moving towards the right, which means that the magnetic force that's exerted on this particle points in the opposite direction than the direction that you get by taking the cross product between the velocity and the magnetic field. And this means that this particle here has to be negative. So I'm going to fill that in with a yellow color here. 
Now this last particle here, we can see it's just traveling in a straight line. So remember, that means that there's no force that's being exerted on a particle, right? That's Newton's first law. A particle will travel in a constant uh, velocity unless it's acted on by a force. So this particle is traveling in a constant velocity in a straight line. That means there's no force that's being exerted on this particle. And if we look at this formula here, if you think about that, if the particle had zero charge, then there's going to be no magnetic force exerted on it. So this, this particle number two is just a particle that has no charge. It's just a neutral particle. So now that we've practiced using the right hand rule, I now want to consider the motion of an object that is traveling perpendicular to the magnetic field. So I first want to just consider a positively charged particle and let's say this particle starts out with a velocity which points vertically upwards. So if we apply the right hand rule, so I need to orient my right hand so that my fingers point towards the top of the screen, and I need to be able to curl my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, which points into the screen. So if I orient my hand so that my fingers point towards the top of the screen, and my palm points towards the screen, then my thumb is going to point towards the left side of the screen. So that means the magnetic field, I'm sorry, the magnetic force that's exerted on this particle points towards the left side of the screen. So this particle is going to take some kind of path that maybe is going to look a little bit like this. So it's going to travel up and it's slowly going to be moving towards the left. And at some point later my particle is going to be over here and its velocity is going to point upwards and towards the left like so. So now if I apply the right hand rule at this point, I need to orient my hand so that the fingers on my right hand point towards the top left corner of the screen and I need to have my palm pointing towards the screen so that my fingers can curl into the direction of the magnetic field, which is pointing into the screen. And when I do this, my thumb is going to point towards the bottom left corner of the screen. So my magnetic force at this point points downwards and towards the left, like this. So the particle is going to continue on this curved trajectory, and eventually it's going to reach this point up here, where the particle is moving towards the left side of the screen. So my particle is going to be up here, and now it's going to be moving towards the left side of the screen. And once again, if I just apply the right hand rule, I'll see that the magnetic force is going to point downwards towards the bottom of the screen. And so hopefully at this point you can see that what's going to happen is that if a particle is moving perpendicular to a magnetic field, the particle is going to move around in a circular path. And the particle is actually going to undergo uniform circular motion. In fact, if we think about this, this magnetic force is always going to be perpendicular to the velocity. And that's exactly what you need to have uniform circular motion. So this means that this magnetic force is actually supplying a centripetal acceleration. So we can set the magnetic force equal to the centripetal force. And remember, the magnetic force is equal to QVB times sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. Now in this case, the velocity and the magnetic field are 90 degrees apart, and sine of 90 degrees is 1. So the magnetic force in this case is just QVB. And this has to be equal to the centripetal force, which remember is equal to MV squared divided by R. So if I solve for the radius of this motion, which is called the cyclotron radius, we can see that the radius is going to be equal to, well, let's see, this velocity here is going to cancel with one of these velocities. Let me show the steps in between, actually. So I'm going to multiply the radius over here, so we'll have QB times R is equal to MV. So the cyclotron radius is equal to MV divided by QB. So let's go ahead and work through a couple of examples. The first example says, a uniform magnetic field of 0.48 teslas is applied perpendicular to the motion of a charged particle. The particle has a charge of 8.4 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs and is initially moving with a speed of 140 meters per second. The radius of the resulting motion is 960 meters and the question asks us to determine the mass of the charged particle. Now, when working through these types of problems, I would recommend not trying to memorize the cyclotron radius formula, but just go back to this basic idea that the magnetic force is equal to the centripetal force. 
or the magnetic force is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration. So the magnetic force is QVB, and this has to be equal to MV squared over R. Now in this case, I'm solving for mass. So if I rewrite this formula to solve for mass, so I'm going to multiply the radius over here and divide by velocity. I'm going to see that the mass is going to be equal to QBR divided by V. And if I plug the values that have been given to me in this problem, I can see that the mass of the particle is going to be equal to 1.58 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. So let's go ahead and look at another example. The second example says, a newly discovered particle has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It is found that when traveling perpendicular to a 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3 Tesla magnetic field, the particle undergoes uniform circular motion with a period of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. And the question asks us to determine the mass of the new particle. And this is actually a very realistic type of a problem because it turns out that when particles move in circles, they generate magnetic fields, and it'd be very easy to measure this period by detecting that magnetic field. So how do we solve this problem? Well, again, we're going back to this idea that the magnetic force is going to generate the centripetal acceleration. So this has to equal mv squared over r. So we have right away that qvb is equal to mv squared divided by r. And again, I can always cancel out that velocity at the beginning. Now, if we look at the information that was given to me, I'm not told anything about the velocity. Instead, I'm only told the period of its motion. And remember that when we have circular motion, we can relate the period and radius of its motion to its velocity. So the velocity is equal to the distance that the particle travels when it goes around the circle divided by the amount of time it takes for the particle to go around this circle. So that's equal to the distance of the circle, so that's 2 pi r, that's the circumference of the circle, divided by the amount of time it takes for the particle to go around the circle. And that's what we call the period. So if I plug that into this formula here, so right now we have qb is equal to mv divided by r, but if I plug that formula in for V, I have this is equal to m times 2 pi r divided by the period, and this whole thing's divided by r. So we can see the radius of the motion cancels out, which is good because we weren't given that. So we can see that qb is just equal to 2 pi m divided by the period. So now if I solve for the mass, I have that the mass of the particle is going to be given by qb times the period divided by 2 pi. And if I plug all these numbers into a calculator, I can see that this is going to be equal to 1.89 times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms. So let's take a look at one more example. This example says an alpha particle, which consists of two protons and two neutrons, has a mass of 6.64 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And this alpha particle is accelerated from rest through a potential difference of minus 1.2 times 10 to the 6 volts before entering a region with a magnetic field of 2.2 tesla and that magnetic field points perpendicular to the motion of the particle. And the question asks us to determine three things. The first question asks us to find the velocity of the particle when it enters the region with the magnetic field. The second question asks us to find the magnitude of the magnetic force that will be exerted on that charged particle when it enters the region with the magnetic field. The last part asks us to find the cyclotron radius of the particle. So I think I'm going to need a whole lot of room to work through this problem, so let me go ahead and open up a blank sheet. So I have written down the information that was given to us in this problem, and one of the bits of information that wasn't really explicitly stated was the charge of the alpha particle. However, because the alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons, we can see that the charge of this particle is just equal to twice the uh, elementary charge, which is 3.2 times 10 to the minus 16 coulombs. Now, the first part of this problem asks us to determine the speed of the particle after it travels through a minus 1.2 times 10 to the 6 volts difference. 
And because the voltage is related to the potential energy of a charged particle, we're going to have to use conservation of energy to determine the speed of this particle. So remember, conservation of energy says that the initial potential energy, I'm sorry, the initial total energy is equal to the final total energy. So this means the initial kinetic energy plus the initial electrostatic potential energy is going to be equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final electrostatic potential energy. And because the particle starts from rest, the initial kinetic energy is just zero. So if I solve for the final kinetic energy, I can see that this is equal to the initial electrostatic potential energy minus the final electrostatic potential energy. Or in other words, it's minus the change in the electrostatic potential energy. And it's minus because delta potential energy is usually final minus initial, but here we have initial minus final. And remember, the change in the electrostatic potential energy can be written in terms of the charge and the voltage difference. So the change in the potential energy is Q times delta V. And the final kinetic energy is just equal to minus this. So the final kinetic energy is 1 half M times V final squared. So solving for my final velocity, I can see the final velocity squared is going to be equal to 2, sorry, minus 2 Q delta V divided by M. So V final is just equal to the square root of that. And if I plug all these numbers into a calculator, I can see that the final velocity is going to be equal to 1.07 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Now, the second part of the problem asks us to determine the magnitude of the magnetic force that's exerted on the particle when it enters a region of 2.2 Tesla. So remember, the magnetic force is equal to QVB times sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. In this problem, we're told that the velocity and magnetic field are perpendicular, which means this angle is 90 degrees, and sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1. So this term is just going to be 1, and the magnetic force, or the magnitude of the magnetic force, I really should say, is equal to QV times the magnitude of the magnetic field. So plugging in the velocity that we found in part A, we can see that this is going to be equal to 7.57 times 10 to the minus 12 newtons. So that's the strength of the magnetic force that's exerted on the alpha particle. Now the very last part of the problem asks us to determine the cyclotron radius. So there are several different ways that we could approach this. One way is that we can say, well, the magnetic force is supplying the centripetal acceleration. So the magnetic force is equal to mv squared over r. So if I solve for r, because I've been given the magnetic force, we found the velocity in part a, we've been given the mass, so I can literally just solve for r here. I can see that the cyclotron radius is going to equal mv squared divided by the magnetic force. So here, we've been given all of these values. The mass, oh, what was the mass? It's like six points. Uh, 6, 4 times 10 to the minus 27. So we have 6.64 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The velocity, which we found in part A, is equal to uh, 1.07 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. We're squaring that, and then we divide it by the magnetic force, which we found in part B, which is 7.57 times 10 to the minus 12 newtons. And if you plug all this into a calculator, you'll see that this cyclotron radius is equal to 0 0.101 meters. And so at this point, I think I'd like to end this video. And in the next video, we'll talk about the magnetic force that's exerted on a current-carrying wire.